Hey, Life Point Church. Well, it has been a while since I've had to preach to an empty room. Well, I guess not that empty. There is a camera here. But here we are doing this again. We've done it for quarantine, pandemic, shutdown stuff. We did it for a hurricane evacuation. I have to be honest with you, I was not expecting having to do it for a, a winter snow freezing ice storm. Uh, hitting southeast Texas. Uh, I hope you're all doing well and staying warm. We are about to see some weather that we're not real accustomed to here in southeast Texas. Also, let me say happy Valentine's Day. I, I am sure that this is not how you wanted to spend your Valentine's Day, but I pray that you feel loved today and those that you love, I hope you will let them know how you feel about them. I would like to share <clears throat> a short devotional with you today. We are, we're we're going to pause and take a break on the end time study today. It was, it's a really good sermon, and I would really like some people to be here whenever I preach it. I think I think you're going to really be be blessed by it. But we're going to just, just kind of take a break on that. I wanted to bring you something a little bit um, less intense, maybe a little bit shorter. I'd like to share with you what I shared with the church board back in January, just a few weeks ago. At, at, at every board meeting since this church has been in, in existence, I have op opened up the meeting with a devotional. I feel it is important that as the board, we always keep God and his word first in our meetings. It would be wrong of us to make decisions about the church without first taking some, some time to, uh, to study the word and to consider what God might be saying to us. For a couple of weeks leading up to the January meeting, when I would be praying and having my personal time with the Lord, I kept being led to the story of the 12 Hebrew spies that were sent out to investigate the promised land. I knew the Lord wanted me to look at this, and I felt like it, it was for the board and, and after giving it to the board, I really wanted to share it with you. And I had planned on waiting until after the end time study to give this. But uh, as you can tell, the end time study is taking longer than I expected and probably longer than you had anticipated. And this seemed like a really good opportunity today to share with, with you what I shared with the church board. So go ahead, if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Numbers chapter 13. If you don't have your Bibles right there in front of you, go ahead and press pause on the video. Go grab your Bibles, grab you a notebook to take a couple of notes with, and then come back and hit, hit play. But, but we're going to begin in Numbers 13 and verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send out men for yourself to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving, which I'm going to give, excuse me, to the sons of Israel. You shall send a man. From each of their father's tribes, every one a leader among them. Now, I want you to notice three important things from this passage. Number one, the Lord said to send out the spies. Sending out the spies was God's idea. It, it wasn't Moses' idea. Moses and the spies, all they had to do was be obedient to do what God told them to do. Go out and spy the land. Second, I want you to notice the way that the Lord described the land of Canaan. He said, it is a land that I am going to give the sons of Israel. They were assured possession of the land before they went out on the mission. They were assured possession of the land before they actually took it. He said, go and spy out the land that I'm going to give to you. Third, who were the spies? They were, they were leaders in their tribes. The spies were people of influence people of position. <clears throat> they were people that others looked up to. Moses begins to give the assignment. He gets all the spies together. You know, he says, okay, I want you from this tribe and you from this tribe and you from that tribe and you from that tribe. He gets them all together. He, and he says, when you, when you get there, I want you to look around. I want you to get a lay of the land how does it look? Do the people look strong? Are the cities well, well, well guarded? Because they're going to have to attack the city and take the city. And look at how he closes out his instruction to them before the spies leave for their mission. 
Numbers 13 and verse 20. And how is the land? Is it productive or unproductive? Are the trees in it or not? That's stuff that they're supposed to find out. Then Moses tells them, and show yourselves courageous and get some of the fruit of the land. Moses tells them to show yourself courageous. Some Bible versions will say to be of good courage. To take possession of what God has for you will require courage from you. And courage is an important quality. Courage isn't needed when there, when there is no battle. You don't need courage when there isn't an enemy. You don't need courage when there aren't any obstacles in, in the way. You only need courage if there is a fight that is going to happen, if there is some obstacle, if there's something that might normally cause you a little bit of fear and concern, then you would need courage. They needed courage because something was going to be in the way between them and the promised land, between them and what God said, I'm going to give you. Now, these spies had many reasons to be courageous. One was the land was promised to them. God said, I'm going to give it to you. So be of good courage. God's going to do this for you. Second, they saw everything that God did for them back in Egypt through the plagues and the exodus. He saw them. Uh, he saw how God parted the waters of the Red Sea. They saw how God gave them food to, food to eat and water to drink and led them with a, uh, with a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He did all of those things. So they had, they had good reason to be courageous. Third, and this is kind of what I want you to notice today, the land that they're spying out was very important land in their family history. They had heard about this land since they were kids. They had heard stories of what had happened there in the past. Notice one of the cities. So the spies go out and it says where they begin to look. And uh, see Numbers 13, verse 22. When they had gone up into the Negev, they came to Hebron. There's a city. They, they came to Hebron where Ahiman, Sheshai, and Talmai, the, the descendants of Anak, were. Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. Now, now, now we're going to talk about Anak here in a couple of minutes. But notice that they came to Hebron. Hebron is a very important place in Jewish history. A lot of great things happened in Hebron. Let me tell you about a few of them. Abram and Lot <clears throat> go way back in time. Abram and Lot, they've, they've left home and they're going where God is telling them to go. And they get to this place and Abram and Lot have a choice. And Lot's family can live in one place and Abram's family can live in one place. And Abram being the leader of the family, he says, Lot, I'm going to let you make the choice first. You can, you can choose first. And so he looked over all the land and he took what he thought was the best land. And Abram is left with what is second best, according to he and Lot. Genesis 13, starting verse 14. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, now raise your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward, eastward and westward. For all the land which you see, I will give to you and to your descendants forever. And I will make your descendants as plentiful as the dust of the earth. So that if anyone can count the dust of the earth, then your descendants could also be counted. Arise, walk about in the land through its length and width, for I will give it to you. Verse 18, Then Abram moved his tent and came and lived by the oaks of Mamre, which are in Hebron. And there he built an altar to the Lord. Abram has promised all of this land. He's promised great descendants. <clears throat> and Abram sets up camp in Hebron by the oaks of Mamre. And he builds an altar there. He wanted this place to be remembered as the place where God had made a promise about land. He said, this land is going to be yours as far as your eye can see. I wonder if the spies, all those years later, if when they're spying out Hebron, if they notice the altar that Abram had built. 
I wonder if they saw the oaks of Mamre and thought about the stories that maybe they heard as they were growing up. Fast forward a few years in Abram's life, and eventually he becomes Abraham. And Abraham is sitting outside of his tent, and the Lord appears to him. The Lord comes down in human form, he and two angels. And now, I understand that at this time in Abraham's life, he and Sarah still do not have a child together. Sarah is barren and unable to have children. Now, Abraham knows that he has been promised plentiful descendants, as, as many as the, as the dust of the earth. So it's hard to see how the promise of many descendants can be fulfilled if he and Sarah can't have children. So years later, he's sitting outside of his tent, and the Lord shows up. Genesis 18, starting verse 1. Now the Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre while he was sitting at the tent door in the heat of the day when he raised his eyes and looked. Behold, three men were standing opposite him. Fast forward to verse 10. He says, and the Lord says, I will certainly return to you at this time next year. And behold, your wife Sarah will have a son. And this is that famous part of the story where where Sarah's in the tent, she hears all of this, and she laughs to herself. Oh, how funny, how, how ridiculous, I'm going to have a son. Hebron was not only the place where he had the promise of land, Hebron was the place where he had the promise of descendants. Hebron, were, Hebron was the place where Abram met the Lord and two angels. Hebron was the place where Isaac was promised to be born. Hebron was the place where the, where the Lord showed up and spoke a promise. I wonder if the spies recalled that when they spied out to the land of Hebron. One more bit of history. Abraham had already purchased a portion of Hebron. So when the spies are out there looking at Hebron, part of that already belonged to their family. Genesis 23, starting verse 19. After this, Abraham buried his wife Sarah in the cave of the field of Machpelah facing Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. So the field and the cave that was in it were deeded over to Abraham for a burial site by the sons of Heth. Abraham bought the land from, from the sons of Heth. He wanted a place to bury Sarah. They sold him a portion near the Oaks of Mamre in Hebron. This site remained in the family for generations. Jacob, who later becomes Israel, Abraham's grandson Jacob, is about to die. And I want you to listen to the instructions that he gives his, his family. Genesis 49 and verse 30. He says, bury me in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah which is opposite Mamre in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought along with the field from Ephron the Hittite as a burial site. There they buried Abraham and his wife Sarah. There they buried Isaac and his wife Rebekah. And there I, I buried Leah. So I wonder if when the spies got to Hebron and they began to spy out the land, did they notice the burial place? Did they find the cave that was in the field of Machpelah, opposite Mamre? Did they, did they see the burial place where the remains of Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Rebekah, Leah, and Jacob were? The patriarchs and the matriarchs of Israel. Did they, did they find that when they spied out the land? This is the land that they were to spy out. This is the land that God was going to give to them. It was a land that had been promised to Abraham generations before, and it was a, in, a, in a portion of the land that Abraham had already purchased. Be of good courage and receive what God has said he will do. So the spies go out, and they see the land. As they arrive back, Moses gathers all of the people to hear the spies report. Everyone's excited. What are the spies going to say? Numbers 13. Pick, pick the story back up in verse 27. 
So they reported to him and said, We came into the land where you sent us, and it certainly does flow with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who live in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. And indeed, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Yeah, they told them how great the land was. They even showed them the amazing fruit that they brought back. But they said that the cities are strong and fortified, and the descendants of Anak are there. Now, who are the descendants of Anak? These spies are going to elaborate on that. Look at verse 31, Numbers 13, verse 31. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people because they are too strong for us. So they brought a bad report of the land which they had spied out to the sons of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to spy out is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are people of great stature. We also saw the Nephilim there. The sons of Anak are part of the Nephilim. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. Now these spies, they, they had to have known the history of Israel because remember, they're leaders in their, in their tribes. They knew what God had done in the past for them in Egypt, in the Exodus and all the way through. They knew what God had done for their ancestors. They knew that God had promised the land to them. They knew how great and how blessed the land was. They even had the fruit that they brought back to prove it. Yet, they gave a bad report. They were men of fear and not of courage. They saw the giants and said, we are too small and they are too big. We are like grasshoppers in our own eyes. You see, they had more faith in their small stature than they did in God's promise and God's ability to bring about God's promise. You need, to, you, you need to see what happened next. Because remember, they're giving this report not just to Moses, but to the whole congregation. The whole nation's there. All the people have shown up to hear them give this bad report. The very next verse, Numbers 14, verse 1. Then all the congregation raised their voices and cried out, and the people wept that night. And all the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the entire congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or even if we had died in this wilderness. So why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become plunder. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, Let's appoint a leader and return to Egypt. All the people heard the negative report and they believed it. All the people heard the impossibility and they believed it. They were ready to turn on Moses and Aaron and God. They were ready to go back to bondage. Fear had so gripped them that they forgot what God had done. And they were ready to give it all up. Ladies and gentlemen, don't, don't let the giant standing between you and the promise of God cause you to lose faith in God. Now, of the 12 spies, there were two that saw things differently. Numbers 13 and verse 30, then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, we should by all means go up and take possession of it, for we will certainly prevail over it. Oh, to be a man like Caleb, to have that kind of faith. Numbers 14, starting verse 6, And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, of those who spied out the land, tore their clothes. They spoke to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. 
Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land, for they will be our prey. Their protection is gone from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. If you continue to read in Numbers 14, you'll find that the, that the people of Israel were ready to stone them for saying this. Caleb and Joshua were different. They had faith. They had courage. They saw the same land. They saw the, the same people. They saw the same giants. They saw the, the same tall annex. They saw the same fortified cities. But they never forgot who they were and who their God was and what he had promised to do. So what obstacles are you facing today? What giant is staring you down? What is between you and the promise of God? What is standing between you and your destiny? You need to see God's response to the spies and to the people. Numbers 14, verse 29. Your dead bodies will fall in this wilderness. All your numbered men, according to your complete number, from 20 years old and upward, who have grumbled against me, by no means will you come into the land where I swore to settle you, except for Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. Because of fear, many of those people never saw what God had said they could have. Because of faith, Caleb and Joshua entered the land. I ask you today, where is your faith? Who or what is the object of your faith? Are you more certain of the impossibility before you or of the power of the God you serve. Can God still accomplish his purpose for you or are the giants too big and you're too small? Hebrews 11, verse 6, Without faith it is impossible to please him. For the one who comes to God must believe that he exists and that he proves to be one who rewards those who seek him. I want to encourage you today, choose faith over fear. Let me ask you another question. Are you like the ten spies telling others there's no way God can do it for them? Are you like the ten, the ten spies who influenced others to doubt God, doubt his power, and cause fear and turmoil? You see, we should not only be people of faith, but we should be the people who encourage others to live by faith. Three take-homes. Number one, God is a God of promise. All the way back to Abram, he had promised this land. And now they were ready to receive it. And upon, just before they sent out the spies, he renews the promise, the land that I am giving to the sons of Israel. So if you're living and breathing today, God has a promise for you. Number two, choose faith over fear. Choose to trust God. Choose to believe God. Yes, there are probably giants between you and your destiny. Yes, there is probably a battle to fight between you and getting to what God has for you. There is an obstacle to overcome, but be, a, but be of good courage. Show yourself courageous. God is with you. If he promised it, he'll get it to you. And number three, faith and fear are both contagious. Which one do you choose to spread today? If you would, please bow your heads. Father God, I thank you for every person watching this today. 
And God, I, I ask that you would give them boldness and hope and faith. Give them a, a resolve to hang on to you no matter the giant they may face. And God, the giants in our lives can have different names. It, it can be a giant of sickness. It can be a giant of disease. It can be a giant of hurt, a giant of failure. It can be a giant of worry, a giant of anxiety. It can be a, a giant of unmet expectations. It can be a giant of unforgiveness. It, the giants are, have many names. But God, today I ask that you would cause your people to see you and your promise more than they see the giants standing between them and you. And may they today choose to trust you. And not only that, God, I ask that you would make us a positive people, an upbeat people, an encouraging people, that we would, we would live lives of faith in such a way that it would encourage others to live a life of faith, that that we would, we, we, we would give words of faith to others, that we would lift them up and encourage them and come al alongside them and walk with them. Finally, God, I just pray a prayer of blessing and protection over Life Point Church, over all of the people, their homes and their families. Father, during this winter storm, protect them. Put a hedge of protection around their homes, around their families, their property, their possessions, Father. Let no evil befall them. Let no destruction come their way. Keep them safe, warm, and blessed. In Jesus' name. And if you receive that, would you say amen? I am thankful for the opportunity to get to share this with you today. I, I am praying for you. I look forward to next weekend. We're going to we're going to get back into our end time study called Live Ready. We're going to, be, we're going to begin looking at the uh, seven churches listed in Re 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 Revelation. It, phenomenal stuff. I'm really excited to share it with you. I love you. I'm praying for you. Can't wait to see you next weekend. God bless you. Have a great, safe, and warm week.